classes in statistical mechanic. Lectures by Professor George Phillies, based on his book, Elementary Lectures in Statistical Mechanics, Springer Verlag, 2000. And today, this lecture is Lecture 17, Evaluating Cluster Integrals. Okay, today we're going to advance to Chapter 18. Chapter 18 discusses various techniques for evaluating the cluster integrals we found in Chapter 17. Uh, for example, equation 18.1 gives us uh, the second virial coefficient of, of a non-ideal gas. It gives it to us in terms of an integral over the Mayer function f12. And it's just a straightforward volume integral over the Mayer function we can also write it as a, as a cluster symbol, and the cluster symbol is the two dots linked by the line. Having said, we can represent B as a cluster symbol. Uh, the question is, and we could also do this for all of the upper variable coefficients if you work hard enough. But the next question, having done this, is, well, that's very nice, but um, how do we actually evaluate the cluster integrals to get numbers out of them? Uh, the simplest case is provided by the hard sphere system. In a hard sphere system, here's a hard sphere, the potential energy is zero of two spheres or further apart than their diameter, two radii, but if they try to get inside each other, there is an infinite level of repulsion. Yes? Mm -hmm. um, well, so that's a fairly simple potential energy. It's infinity from zero to r, and it's zero afterwards. Well, if the potential in ener energy is infinity, what is exponential of minus beta u? It's exponential minus beta infinity, or zero out to r, and above r, it's x minus beta u, x minus beta 0 is 1. So the um, statistical way, e to the minus beta u, is 0 if the two spheres try to be inside each other, and is 1 everywhere outside. The Mayer fun f function is e to the minus beta u minus 1. So the Mayer f function is minus 1 out to r, and 1 minus 1 or 0 outside. So the Mayer f function has a very short range. The Mayer f function is 0 except when the two spheres are quite close together. So far so good. Well, okay, so let us actually stick that Mayer f function in e into equation 18.1. Now, 18.1 has a volume integral over dr sub 1, 2, and in 18.2 we've rewritten that volume integral in terms of a distance coordinate and two angular coordinates. The angular coordinates are integrated over 4 pi. The distance variable is formally integrated from 0 to infinity. Of course, the there's nothing in there that depends on the direction, so the angular integrals are just the radial, or rather angular area of a sphere, or 4 pi. Uh, furthermore, the distance integral has the nice feature that f, the last thing is in 18.2, f is a zero except if r is less than 2a. So while the integral is formally from zero to infinity, only the part from zero to 2a does any. And so you notice 18.3 has shrunk down a bit. Um, and now we say, what's the volume of a sphere relative to its radius? Why, it's 4 pi a cube over 3. This is no surprise. And if you actually do the integral in 18.3, uh, you get 18.4, that the volume, the b2, is 4 times the volume of a hard sphere. Um, and now we introduce an interesting conceptual object, which is just a math symbol. We say we will take the number of particles 
number density of particles, number per unit volume, and we will multiply it by the fraction of the volume that is occupied by one particle. So I have this one particle, and it occupies, oh, 10 to the minus 5 of the volume of the room, whatever, and um, we will multiply it by the d number density of particles, and we will get the, what is called the volume fraction, the fraction of the volume of the system that is occupied by the particles. Now, volume fraction makes perfect sense for hard spheres. On the other hand, if you had something that was soft or had a funny shape potential, volume fraction in terms of what it corresponds to physically is a little fuzzier. Okay, so what happens? We have calculated the second virial coefficient. It's a positive number. It's plus 4 times something that converts the density into the volume fraction. So what the um, hard sphere repulsion does is to increase the gas pressure above what the gas pressure would be if the atoms didn't interact with each other. Um, <clears throat> now you might say, well, gee, does that integral over F dr, does that represent all of the interacting particle clusters in the problem? Uh, and the answer is, well, not exactly because the integral is non-zero only when, the two, when two pairs of hard spheres are inside each other. But that has a statistical weight zero and corresponds to states that are never found in the system. So saying we are simply looking at interacting clusters, the clusters we would actually find if we looked in, doesn't work. We can say it corresponds to what we see in phase space. That is, we have all of these states in phase space corresponding to the particles being in all different combinations of places. And if we evaluate the statistical weight of those states, um, g, uh, the states in which the particles are inside each other are being subtracted out of phase space. They contribute zero to the phase space integral because they're forbidden conformations. Um, and therefore, we've calculated in some sense how much of phase space, the phase space you'd have for an ideal gas, has been excluded because the particles interact with each other. Yes? Now, people have occasionally tried to say, let us not do the mayor type expansion, cluster expansion that you've seen here. Let us see if we can do an expansion that corresponds to evaluating over the particle positions that you can actually find in nature. And you can hand wave your way into such an approach, but when you reach the far side, um, everyone who has ever tried to do this, so far as I know, when they're finished dotting their I's and crossed their T's, comes back to the same place. So there may be a way to do this, but no one has ever found it. Okay, so um, is this completely a bad thing? Not exactly. Let me take an argument from Fermi on the osmotic pressure. What is osmotic pressure? We have a solvent, and we have here a mesh, and the mesh lets the solvent molecules pass, but the solute molecules, being much bigger, can't get through the mesh. And we then arrange things so we have a high concentration of solute here, and no solute there. And we then ask, we then say, well, the, sol the solute side is open to the air, or whatever. The solvent side is closed but has this little vertical tube going up. It's a barometer tube. If the pressure on the same side, two sides, is the same, the barometer tube is empty and the li liquid is flush on both sides. If we, the pressure inside the solute containing side is larger, the normal state of affairs, the fluid rises in the barometer column 
it rises in the barometer column uh, because you have to equal have the mechanical pressure on the two sides equal and in order to do that we need to have the, the liquid go up the barometer column. Equivalently you can say that solvent pushes in from um, the pure solvent side to the solution side and it keeps pushing in until the pressure on the solution side is higher and keeps more solvent from entering. There are standard thermodynamic calculations based on the Gibbs-Duhem equation for obtaining the osmotic pressure. They're based on the statement that the chemical potential of the solvent on the two sides has to be the same. If the chemical potential were not the same, you could use the system to build a battery in which you do work by moving solvent across. Yes? Well. So what you've said, seemingly, is that the osmotic pressure difference is due to the solvent. However, as was pointed out by Enrico Fermi many decades ago, the mesh has holes. The solvent can pass right through it. Therefore, because the mesh has holes, the solvent can go straight through it. Um... um Gee, the solvent can't be exerting a pressure on that membrane, can it? Oh, it is a real physical pressure. If the osmotic pressure difference is large enough, you pop the membrane for any... For, for the me porous membranes tend to have to be quite weak, most of them. Um, and therefore, the, since the solvent can go through, the pressure difference has to be due to the solute. Well, in fact, statistical mechanics has shown that uh, that Fermi was right. Uh, uh, the Macmillan-Mayer theory, Bob Macmillan's uh, doctoral thesis, shows that you can take, let's do the configuration integral for the solution, and with some clever rearrangements we can eliminate all mention of the solvent, and we have a calculation in which the potential energy of two solutes has been dressed in the high, higher order quantum sense by the presence of the solvent, uh, but it looks ex the uh, calculation looks exactly like a, an ideal gas of solute in which there's no solvent anywhere and you get the osmotic pressure out. So Fermi was right. And some, however, the thermodynamicists were also right. What they s demonstrated was sometimes you can calculate a quantity that is hard to compute by calculating something else that is easy to compute and is equal to the thing that is hard to compute. That's a useful lesson to keep in mind. Okay, so what other, let's do another virial expansion. And we will start at 18.6 as the Lennard Jones or 12.6 potential. Lennard Jones potentials used to be popular, they were treated as being models for the potential energy of a noble gas. 12.6 is not a very accurate representation of, say, the argon-argon interatomic potential, but it has this very nice virtue which you are about to see. In order to see it, what we do is we start with the equation, well, it's basically equation 18.2. The angular integrals can be done, and then we have integral dr r square f of r. And we do an integration by parts. And the integration of parts replaces r square with r cube over 3. That's the side we're integrating. And the f of r term becomes df dr because that's the side on which we're taking the derivative. And if you do that, you get equation 18.7. Now, equation 18.7 has a statistical mechanics interpretation. Um, it's a, a volume integral over the relative position of the two particles. Um, there's an integral dr r square. There's a 4 pi over a half, over 2 I mean, outside. And then there is an e to the minus beta phi, which is the statistical weight. And if you look hard, 
B2 is therefore the statistical average of R d phi dr. That is, there's the integral dr r squared. There's the statistical weight e to the minus beta phi. And there is the thing being averaged r d phi dr. Uh, r d phi dr, well, what's d phi dr? It's the force in the r direction, because phi is just the potential energy. And so th what you're averaging is r dot f, which is the virial. Um, is this useful? Well, let us take equation 18.7 and let us plug into it equation 18.6. Uh, furthermore, when we plug 18.6 into 18.7, there's an e to the minus beta potential energy, yes? Well, the potential energy has two terms. There's an e to the minus beta r to the minus 12 term. And we'll leave that in the exponential. And there's an e to the minus beta, r to the minus 6 term. And we will series expand that term. And that is what you see in 18.8. .8. The first line has the integral dr r cube. And it has d phi dr. The second line has the derivative has um, e to the minus beta phi, but on the second line I have series expanded part of e to the minus beta phi as that summation. Now, this integral looks slightly unattractive. I think that would be one way to put it. But in fact, you're integrating a polynomial times a um, exponential, and if you realize you would like uh, e to the minus, if you'd like r over r to the 12 in the integral to be a variable x, and do a change of variables, or if you find the integral in tables, or if you stuff it into Mathematica, you can do the integral, and b2 is the variable, is the integral. And it's one of these, um, it looks messy, but there's, there, it's a known integral. So there's no problem. OK. OK. Now there's an amusing observation here. 18.9 is a function of two objects. It's a function of the variable x. And what is x? It's uh, beta phi 0. Phi 0 is an 18.6. It's a normalizing constant that tells you how strong the Lenard Jones potential is. And beta phi 0 is that in units of kT. Um, <clears throat> you could then say that you could rewrite everything in terms of two reduced for parameters one of which is v star v over r zero cube, and the other of which is a reduced temperature t over phi naught. You might worry, gee, t has dimensions temperature, phi naught has dimensions energy. Is that reduced? Um, in, yes, if you put in extra kb, it's obvious that it's the ratio of two energies and is now some number times k sub b, or over k sub b. OK. We could also consider more general techniques. Well, one point is the integral depends on the relative positions of the particles in the cluster. It doesn't care if the cluster is here or here or here. It doesn't care if, the, if we have, say, two particles like this if the line is facing this way, or that way, or that way. And so there are three translation variables and two rotation variables that aren't doing much of anything. So they can be skipped. You have to do the integrals, but they're trivial. 
and that takes an integral down from 3n to 3n minus 5 dimensions, the configuration integral. Well, if n is equal to 2 or 3, going from 3n to 3n minus 5 is impressive. If n is equal to 12, it's much less interesting because you, don't, you aren't making that big a change in things. Um, so we then ask, how can we do the expansion? Uh, the first thing to realize, if I've got a real interatomic potential energy, it was almost certainly calculated. It was almost certainly calculated using numerical quantum mechanics, say finite element methods or transfer matrices or whatever as opposed to using um, um, paper and pencil algebra. And therefore, if you have a potential energy, the potential energy has almost certainly been written in terms of a set of numerical tables. So if you want to do these integrals, your phi is um, a numerical table, and it's got to be done numerically. Well, if you're doing a one-dimensional integral, life is not too bad. The reason for that is, um, well, maybe the integral is confined to a small region. You could, and maybe you can just say, I will sample at random from points on the function. And the random sampling of points on the function, this is called the Monte Carlo method, um, the random sampling is good enough. The problem with the random sampling is illustrated by figure 18.1. Here is a function we might contemplate integrating by Monte Carlo methods. The difficulty is that almost all of the area of the function is included in a very narrow zone. And if therefore, if you just choose points at random, you can choose a lot of points at random without representing accurately uh, how big the area under that one needle-like spire is. Okay. Uh, the next problem, which is beyond the first, is that um, we aren't doing a one-dimensional integral. I might say, if I use a thousand points, I've got the integral down fairly well. But if I have, say, instead a four-dimensional integral or a seven-dimensional integral, and I'm going to sample on a thousand points on each axis and then grid in, I have to calculate a thousand to the fourth or a thousand to the seventh numbers. And it starts to get clunky very fast because the variable space is so large. Yes? Okay, uh, the, another place where, gee, random sampling gets you into difficulty is hard spheres. Suppose I'm going to calculate the uh, hard sphere configuration integral by generating configurations of hard spheres at random, calculating the contribution of z to each one, and then going on to the next. Yes, Monte Carlo approach? Well, there's this little difficulty. If the volume fraction of spheres, and it's hard sphere gas, is around, say, a half, I have a problem. Almost every configuration I generate will have two spheres inside each other and will have statistical weight zero as a result. And so if I try ra simple random sampling, I can't find the physical states of the system. They're in there someplace, but I can't find them. Um, okay, there is an alternative to Monte Carlo. The alternative to Monte Carlo is to ask, well, can I make the integrals simpler? And the book will now show you two methods of doing this. One method is due to Katsura and collaborators, and as applied to statistical mechanics, ring diagrams. A ring diagram is a diagram in which you start at particle, and there's always only one choice of path that you haven't traveled available, and when you're done, you get back to the starting point. That's why it's called a ring. A triangle is a ring. 
Now the virtue of rings is that they are what are called doubly connected. That is, from any point on the ring, you can reach another point on the ring through two completely different paths. And it turns out, if you evaluate the cluster it diagrams to see which diagrams contribute to, when you're done with all of the rearrangements, only the doubly connected diagrams, the diagrams in which there are at least two paths from every point to every other point, only the doubly connected diagrams contribute to the variable coefficients, the capital Bs. Uh, the straight line is treated as being doubly connected, special case. So what Katsura did is to advance some tricks with Dirac delta functions that let us do ring diagrams, or as they're called in the statistical mechanics, loop diagrams quite quickly. The trick you are, also about, uh, you are about to see also works in advanced quantum mechanics. Okay, what is the trick? It starts at equation 18.12. And starting at equation 18.12, I make four statements about uh, Fourier transforms, one of which 18.13 is marred. If you look at them for that at the moment, you'll realize the variable of integration is supposed to be r, not k. However, other than that minor difficulty, we say what happens if we integrate over a um, complex exponential? complex exponential times a function. That's just a Fourier transform. Um, the area under a Dirac delta function is 1. And 1815 tells us how to get from the spatial Fourier transform of a function back to the original function. So those are the tricks. Okay, so we shove ahead to 1817, which is a representative loop integral. It's a loop integral because the last step on the path takes me back to the starting point. I can have done all sorts of things in between, but if the, inter the, the diagram is simply a circle, can be drawn simply as a circle, it's doubly connected and is represented by a loop diagram. Okay, well, uh, having done that, we now do a change of variables. And the change of variables, which is in 1818, is as follows. Uh, the element in the loop, f sub 2, 3, is directly simply a var value of the variable r2, 3, distance between 2 and 3. Yes? Well, um, we can rewrite that, that's what's done in 18.18, and to choose all of the integrals over these, um, what we are going to do is take all of the f's and say we're going to choose a limited set of variables for the variables of integration. After all, there only is one set of variables per, variable, per um, particle distance from particle 1, and so what we do is to change the variables, and we integrate over the position of particle 1. That gives us a v. And we integrate over dr12, dr13, and so on. This is in 1818. These are the vector distances from particle 1 to the particle distance of interest. Uh, however, um, what we also do is to say, if we would like a vector connecting particle 2 to particle 3, we write it as two vectors, each one taking us from particle 1 to the origin, and the other bringing us back from the origin to particle 2. And so we have this available change of variables. Um, the last thing we do is to introduce a um, spatial Fourier transform, f tilde, of a function f. Uh, there should be a sign that should be e to the i k plus, e, I said it backwards, that should be exponential of plus i k dot r, 
not exponential, minus ik dot r. Yes? So far, so good. Okay. And now we skip ahead to um, 18.20. And what has been done in 18.20 is to take f, each f function for, on, for example, on the second line, f tilde of k2 is originally f um, tilde of position 2. And we replace r2. And you notice we have this exponential e to the minus ik um, r2 dot r13 minus r12. And so we can write um, the... Um, f functions in terms of Fourier transforms. Now you might ask, why do you want an f function in terms of a Fourier transform? And the answer is you want the f functions in terms of Fourier transform because I can now play games with the Fourier transforms and when I am done I get back to my starting point. But I can simplify things. And so what we do is to say that the spatial for that if, oh by the way if you have two um, spatial Fourier transforms you're integrating over you get a form like 18.21 you also get the complaint um, by about 18.22 um, g what happens we are going to do um, a rearrangement. And so, for example, if you go back to the previous page, if you go back to the previous page, you have an 18.18, an f of r13 minus r12. That's an 18.18. Well, we can do write those as spatial Fourier transforms of the corresponding f tilde of k, and that is exactly what we do. And so we replace the inter original integrals over functions as functions of r with integrals over functions as functions of k, except we need to know what the functions are. And that brings us to 18.22. <clears throat> OK. Well. Uh, 18.22 has the feature, because of all the delta functions, that it sets the um, f tildes equal to each other in the sense they, um, yes. You see all the f tildes? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They're all the same function. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And therefore it's f tilde to the n. Mm -hmm. uh, well, they're not quite the same function. They're each functions of a different k. But on the previous line of that equation, there are a whole pile of delta functions, n minus one of them. Mm -hmm. And each time you integrate a delta function with respect to a k, you set two of the k's equal to each other. When you're done with this, you have gone through n minus one integrations. And what is left is what was left before. Um, and you get 18.23. So you systematically set each of the k's equal to each other, right? Correct. Yeah. We set Otherwise, each though, yeah. yeah. The, the only term in each of the integrals that yep. doesn't go to zero is when k1 equals k2, k2 yeah, equals k3. Yeah, but then if you do integral by integral, it yeah. eventually makes them all equal. Okay. Yep. Yes. You do it one integral at a time, setting one k equal mm -hmm. to the next. Um, when you've done the integration to make two k's equal, the delta function disappears. And now you have everything the function of the same variable. Mm -hmm. OK? Well, and that leads to integral 18.23, which is the configuration integral for this particular picture, a piece of the configuration integral. And it's integral dk over 2 pi cubed times f tilde times f tilde of k to the n power, yes? Well, f tilde of k to the n power just means we have to have an f tilde, and then we can 
x we can raise the power up and we can have now essentially a one dimensional integral here. One dimensional integrals are good, they're straightforward to do. Okay, there is another method of doing cluster integrals which we will, I am simply going to point out but not explain and it is the vertical ba bank of equations on page 257. 257 is a procedure due to Silverstone and Motes. And they did their calculation exclusively for a quantum problem. So I will describe the problem in terms of quantum mechanics. Here is a hydrogen atom. And it has a wave function. And it may be that the wave function is in an eigenstate of energy um, in which case the electron cloud has some dependence on R and its dependence on angular direction is determined by a, described by a spherical harmonic. A spherical harmonic at the center of this atom. However, suppose I would like to describe this wave function as a spherical harmonic and I would like to do the ex series expansion from a point out here. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Well, if you could do that, and what you have to do is to determine the expansion coefficients if you are out here rather than in there. That is, you want have the expansion coefficients if you are going to describe this wave function, which in the simplest case is just a sphere, in terms of spherical harmonics centered over here. Yes? Mm -hmm. Well, this may be a perfect sphere relative to its own center, but if I do the expansion out there, I discover this isn't vaguely close to being a perfect sphere in this, in this, when we ask the quest, right question. If you ask, what is the spherical harmonic expansion for this wave function, and um, you, your origin is here, that distinction is somewhat important. And this, this battery of equations tells you how to solve the problem. And it works. <clears throat> All right, let us push ahead. Um, in 18.3, I make simply a comment which is that if you are clever, sometimes you can um, rearrange cluster diagrams. And the point I make, if you look at 18.40, there is a sum of two cluster diagrams, an open square and a half-filled square, which was eventually an open square. And, um, gee, can we rearrange this? Yes, I introduce what I call the G-bond fij plus 1, which is e to the minus beta vij. And if you put that definition into the treatment, you discover you can compress these things a great deal, and you get a slightly different angular integral than you did before. Um, but it works. And you can actually find slightly different sets of diagrams by finding new um, um, resummation techniques, of which this is an exemplar. Okay, we have run out of time on Chapter 18. You are still working on the Chapter 17 homework, which was quite extensive. What we have done today is to discuss the issue of how you evaluate cluster integrals, not only the trivial one-dimensional ones, but also cluster integrals involving substantial numbers of particles. We are done. We will continue this next time.